Naomi, ve své knížce popisuje situaci, kdy odchází se svým čtyřletým synem ven hrát si s míčem, když najednou zazvoní telefon a ty zjistíš, že tvoje klientka potřebuje okamžitou konzultaci. Poté, co synkovi oznámí, že nikam nejdete, zeptá se tě na důvod a jakmile mu vysvětlíš, odběhne vesela do svého pokoje hrát si. Také v různých jiných situacích popisují svoje syny vychovávané bez příkazu a zákazu jako vyrovnané, spokojené děti, které se na veřejnosti chovají velmi slušně. Mnoho rodičů, kteří se nechali inspirovat tvými myšlenkami, však zažívá něco zcela jiného. Jejich děti se k ním chovají panovačně, křičí na ně a někdy je i klučou. Nenechají ani chvíli v klidu promluvit s přáteli, kdykoliv je něco jinak, než si přáli nebo představovali, předvádí strašlivé scény. Nepůsobí vůbec dojmem šťastných a spokojených dětí. Kde je chyba? So, well, the whole, the whole workshop is about that. <laughs> so, it's a very big question. But I think, yeah, I see that very often. And the main confusion is confusing kindness with license. License or freedom with license. And not daring to be what I always call a leader. Um, so you know the examples are the best way to show it i just had a parent here just last week with a six years old child and every time there was an issue and this is exactly how parents generally do it that the parent had to say no or stop the child or say no we can't do that or we have to go home now or whatever it is the parent in order to be kind said it in a way that wasn't clear that lacks clarity and the child is left with the sense of we're playing a game i say yes daddy says no or mommy says no and then we go back and forth and we keep doing that they have no sense that this is not a game that actually the parent means it no you can't go into the street no, we're not jumping into the water. Uh, no, we're not eating this ice cream in, in a, you know, out there in a store or at, at a mall or something. Um, but trying to be kind and nice, the parent says, well, no, we're not going to do that. Or, well, we'll talk about it maybe later or not now. Or they say the no, but in a, in a, pretending to be kind and being really unclear and children really thrive on clarity they need that let me know how this world works you know a child grows up and he looks to the parent like you know i need freedom and freedom is limits in a way or discipline i don't like limits that are imposed by parents just for the sake of it of course not but we learn the world we learn that there is um gravity so the child learns oh i can't jump from a high place i'll get hurt they learn it from experience that's a limit that's a boundary we want to rely on a parent in the same way please tell me you know i'm gonna push the walls as far as i can because i count on you to guard my safety and just stop me when it's not right because i don't know i don't know the social codes i'm new here so the main mistakes that parents do and they start when a baby hits them first time you talk about children even hitting their parents and i always ask the parent what did you do when they hit you first time because my children you know one of them gave me one bite breastfeeding so it wasn't intentional but still even when it's not intentional the response has to be very clear that we don't do that they don't know they have no frame of reference why would they know that hitting is not right they're just banging on the parent and the parent you know just say oh it hurts just don't do it or sometimes they guy even play with them because it doesn't hurt because they don't yet have force so they just kind of go as if it's all right well the child is learning it's all right to do this they don't have clarity so for me even the baby the first bite the first pull on the hair the first uh hit you can be gentle but very firm very clear 
such that the child never even try a second time and for sure not third. Maybe sometimes you have to clarify it after a second, but most of the time if you're clear. And the way to know whether you're clear is to compare it to what you would do if the child ran into the busy street. A two years old doesn't know yet, the ball sled under a car and he wants to run in there. And you're clear. As you stop the child, you are not moved by his screaming. You're not moved by the ball or by the purpose to get the ball. You do the right thing. You do it with leadership. You do it with clarity. Then you can validate the feelings. Yeah, you wanted that ball. Well, the ball may be exploded anyway or it's on the other side of the road and we can go get it by going with mommy in her arms or giving a hand carefully and going and getting it. But the fear or the anger that you stop the child can be validated, but the stopping has to happen. And we need to own that and to not be so wishy-washy and to not allow a child to do just because he's weak now and his heating doesn't hurt. You're still teaching them to heat if you let it happen. So whatever we don't want them to do and they need to learn to not do as adults, when they try first time, they need an honest feedback. Not a wishy-washy, well, okay, we'll play now, but in two years, you'll have to know to stop doing this because by then your punches will be strong. Why would they know that? How will they all of a sudden learn? It's the same with, with diapers. It's the same example. We teach them to use disposable diapers. They learned peeing and pooping is in the diaper and it doesn't bother me. And my mother, you know, just let it be. And she puts another one on me because they learned that's where you do it. It's the same thing. You know, when you, we do the kind of uh, diapers that are cloth or we do elimination communication and teach them from the beginning, this is where we pee and poop, not in our clothes or when they do it in a cotton diaper, they can feel it, it's uncomfortable, we change it right away. They learn right away. So why teach them for four years one thing and then tell them, hey, what we taught you was wrong, now we're gonna do something else. <laughs> and you have to completely turn around and now they're confused, what do you mean? That was my whole life, doing it in the diaper, hitting you, biting, spitting. Uh, screaming. If I do tantrums, and that example is very good because children are very intelligent, obviously. They're human beings and they learn. Whatever they do is what we teach them. We can know that in principle. If your child is tantruming, you taught him to tantrum. And the way we teach to tantrum is we respond it as if it's a method to get what you want instead of self-expression. And I have a chapter on that in the book to distinguish those. So when you treat a tantrum as a self-expression without causing it, I want to always clarify that because parents think, well, I can be rude to my children and forbid them everything, and then they have a tantrum and I'll just validate the feeling. No, of course you wanna be kind and you wanna have a life in which the child is respected. And what they want to do is respect it. You don't just take them to restaurants because you want to, if they can't handle it. You want to make the setup such that you don't have to say no all the time. So they have a yard or a play area that is safe and that they can play and that they do have what they need, obviously. But when there is a situation that you have to say no, it needs to be absolutely clear. So when the tantrum is to get something because you didn't get it, first of all, you created it as a parent, not to feel guilty about, we all do that. It's a very common mistake and it comes out of love and kindness and we don't want the child to cry. So we change our mind and we go like, okay, okay, you can have this toy or we do compensation. Oh, oh you're upset that the tower fell. Here, have a candy. Well, what does it teach the child? Hey, if I have tantrums, I get something. Even if it's not the original thing, I get something. And also I learned that I'm emotionally weak. I can't handle not getting what I want in my life. So it's that 
wanting disease that I often talk about, where we teach them, you must get what you want. And we offer them stimulations and foods and entertainment all the time. And if they don't get what they want, oh my God, the end of the world, they start being aggressive because they also feel weak. Like it is honestly hard for them. They think, oh, I, I can't be without it. Because the last time we reacted like it's the end of the world, we did with our anxiety, we compensated quick or we ran for it. Even with the baby, we start with baby. The baby wants something, and oh, let's get it, let's get it. Yeah. And, and, and then we are relaxed. Okay, he has it, he's not crying anymore. But he just learned the lesson, hysteria lesson, panic lesson. Oh my God, I can't handle it. So next time something happened, and as they grow older, they're still living with this sense of if I don't get what I want, oh no the end of the world and then of course they scream and tantrum and heat because they must get what they want because they learned if i don't it's horrible in the coming newsletter as soon as the new website and the new newsletter is going i'm working on it i'm talking about raising powerful people because powerful people are happy people and by the way you say that my children were always so you know happy and cooperative that, that's not true no not it's perfect <laughs> you know i i adjust along the way and i'm learning still now when they tell me how childhood was for them and i discover a lot of mistakes that i made so you all benefit from it because i can teach you even better uh, with what i'm learning uh, and there is no perfect way you know we're human beings it's going to be the variations of issues that children grow up with but certainly it's not so difficult to raise children who are cooperative from their own free will. And it's done with clarity and the tantrum needs when it's not caused unkindly by the parent and unnecessarily, uh, but it's real. The child fell or the, the tower fell or a friend pushed him and it's already over, it's already pushed then you be with the tantrum rather than get scared by it and think that you have to stop the crying and give a compensation. So those are some of the ways, and I'm sure in the workshop, parents will give us more examples of the many ways that come from very loving intentions that we teach a child that they can't handle not having what they want and that the way to get it is to heat, to tantrum, to scream, to have a fit, uh, to be a puddle on the floor, whatever methods that have worked for them. And that even when we think we didn't respond, because some parents say, but we don't give them, you know, based on the tantrum or a heating what they want. And when I work with the parent more thoroughly, it looks like the child does get something out of it even if it's not that they gave them what they wanted they did get maybe finally mommy was with me <laughs> you know it could be the attention we're trying to do the kitchen and to make dinner or to clean up or to be on the phone or to do emails and the child needs our attention so again part of what I call be kind don't cause the tantrum don't cause it you know passively by not meeting the needs. So a child whose needs are met and you're there for them and you interrupt what you do when they tell you, hey, mom, I need you. Generally, they don't need to tantrum. So we want to take that need away. And the mistake is mostly lack of clarity and fear of the emotional expression of the child. The parent is afraid of it and stops it in ways that teach the child that tantruming is a great tool instead of a great self-expression. Okay. And I'm looking forward to get a lot more deeper into, especially this subject, it's almost all-encompassing. Uh, so much come into play that relates to this that we would cover in the workshops and in the talks uh, when I will be there in October.